by some states as being necessary for use in groups. I think this is something which can be used much more, it can be mainstreamed, there can be, I mean, just like there have been in uh, other environmental issues like the use of coal and oil, I would like to see that the use of materials like plastic, like existing buildings, the debris of existing buildings which already contain sand or other aggregates or other industrial waste like slag and uh, glass and other industrial waste can be mainstreamed for use instead of natural sand or natural stone or any other natural material. I would like to see a situation where just like has been done for coal and oil over the years through the involvement of corporations, of governments, of NGOs, academics, everybody joined me. But today, if I would like to be environmentally friendly as an individual, I am able to um, set up a solar system in my own house. There have been countries which have completely switched over to renewable energy sources of various kinds. We have very qualified engineers and scientists who are able to come up with solutions which we can't even dream of today. Today, we take it for granted that the whole world relies on concrete as the only building material that can take the world forward. I would challenge this assumption and say that today this is the way we know it, this is the way we grow, because we have never understood that sand is a not a renewable resource, it is something which is running out. But we understand it today, and rather than waiting for the day when it actually runs out, just like oil, and then start looking at solutions, the time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Samaria, for this fantastic testimony. Uh, this is very uh, um, great to hear your voice. I mean, you've been active so long in this area, and your, your voice is, is definitely heard here. And we, we wait, you know, we will be in contact, we stay in contact. But um, this report we're going to make is about solutions, it's about trying to find alternatives, about substitutions, about reductions of sand, and about framing uh, sand extractions. And we got lots of material that is coming. Now, is there anybody in the, in the room who's got any question for Samara? Yes, please. Um, hey, please come, come okay, closer to the microphone, maybe. maybe. Thank you, so I will just briefly introduce myself. I'm a master's student, and now we create a project around the sand mining and exploitation. So my question is, in what way the local societies are touched directly by the problem so what's the basis, the local basis of the sound exploitation? Thank you. Well, the local community has already lost its livelihood due to organization of various kinds. And um, they are suffering a great deal because the sand which they are extracting and selling into the market is, is uh, they are being promised jobs in the sand mining industry, but the jobs are so menial and so difficult and in fact they are life threatening. Uh, they are threatening to their health and also threatening to their life. So they are the, the losers in every way. They, they are losing their land. They can't, can no longer farm. They are losing their farmland. And um, they are left with these very menial jobs in areas where they have lived for generations and owned the land. They have owned the land. They have had no shortage of food. And the work they have done has has given them a life of dignity. That dignity is being taken away from them. I would also like to add that I have seen child labor at some of these sites. I've spoken to some of these people. I mean, you'll find all these photographs of the site visits up on my website, they're dated, and um, you will see also some of them include child labor. One child that I spoke to said he started mining. He said he was 13 at the time I talked to him, and he had been mining for about three years. He said that he started mining because he fell ill and he had a high fever and couldn't attend school. So his parents said, well, since you're obviously not going to make it through school, you may as well do sand mining. And um, I mean, that whole concept of someone, an ill child being made to do that, and I saw him struggling under the load. You know, this thin body with these rippling muscles, it's so incongruous, so horrible to see. Yes. There's just one small, small thing which I left out, and that is that sand mining also threatens existing infrastructure. We had a bridge collapse a few years ago in Mumbai, uh, sorry, around Mumbai in Maharashtra. 
where a number of people died. And they found sand mining equipment at the base of the bridge. And they also, that is the same spot where I was attacked in 2010 in Mohad. But in spite of that, the government made a statement that sand mining is not responsible for the collapse of the bridge. The railways has made numerous representations to the government saying that its railway bridge, its main railway bridge is threatened by sand mining. And I have a video of a train passing over a bridge where the base of the bridge is exposed and sand mining is happening at the base. That's, that's, uh, that's is unbelievable. That's a, so people taking sand that actually can create the total disaster by a, a bridge collapsing. This is criminal. Yes, you have a question, yeah. Professor Mara? Yes, thank you very much and uh, for your story. I think you're stimulating us to um, into the future, how the future might look like. Um, um, my question would be, assuming that the cost for sand would go up in India, uh, maybe because it has become scarce, maybe because of other reasons, how would that affect um, the things on the ground? Now, would it, for example, stimulate the search for alternatives? Or would it maybe also uh, increase the competition, let's say, or maybe even a little sand mine in your country? I'm just asking, uh, before we think we find the golden bullet, how, how would that kind of thing work out in your country? Thank you very much. Well, the growth of India is related to infrastructure growth and building. So sand is a very crucial ingredient of that. <clears throat> and it would, I mean, I am all for building infrastructure and growth. What I would like to know is how this is going to affect, first of all, we are impacting some of our existing infrastructure already. For example, a city like Mumbai, which is surrounded by water on all sides, it's an island. When you extract sand from every side, you are threatening the very infrastructure which you are building out of sand. So there's a huge potential cost to that, and to recoup from that situation if buildings start collapsing in Mumbai, or in, in producing um, enough breakwaters. So it's going to be kind of a cyclical situation, and I'm trying to say that it is going to involve a huge cost in any case. So the cost has to be paid either now in finding solutions which can take care of it before the disaster happens or later in mitigating the disaster. And I think it just makes sense the disaster is so imminent that already we are starting to see bridge collapses, we are starting to see eroding land, we are starting to see uh, farmlands being depleted, trees fallen down on beaches, you know, depth, all those things already. Since we are seeing them, we are not even waiting for climate change, we are just doing it ourselves very directly. It just makes sense that rather than waiting 10 years and then paying the cost, that we start paying the cost now. Okay, that, that's great. Uh, Any other question? Sure. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Jerry. I'm also a master student at the UNICH. I really agree with you that we need to really monitor the sites of extraction themselves that get as close to where it's happening as soon as, uh, as soon as possible. I was wondering if you saw any potential or a solution in directly involving you know, the citizens or the local communities or even the locals themselves in gathering data or monitoring or even going so far as to co-produce or help um, have their help in thinking of new policies to kind of combat, combat the sand extraction problem. Thanks. We have done that. Um, I think I mentioned that some of the locals have joined us even in public investigation and they are supplying the ground of the data continuously. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is actually in court now and has had, in his own district, has had a, a community, has the, uh, not a community involvement in a government committee which is monitoring sand mining, they are providing daily assistance because the government doesn't have equipment, even boats, to monitor mining, which they themselves have, self have sanctioned on creeks and rivers. So it's the fishing community which is helping them monitor it. And so they're very much on board. This is the reason why I'm able to visit sites. Um, I realize that it's really dangerous to go there without direct help, direct support from people who live there. So. They're very much part of the whole thing. Having said that, they themselves are under threat. When I go there, even with community support, we have had instances where we've had 
uh, stones thrown at us. They say in their own community that some of them can't walk down a village street at night. So it has really torn communities apart. And it's impossible to have total community support, but definitely there is some. We've also been advocating that these sand miners who are actually victims themselves should be rehabilitated as they have been in forests. You know, in forests of, of India, people who are poachers have been taken on board and made the guides in the forest. They are the tourist guides who will conduct you because they have lived in those areas, they know those areas, they're invested in those areas. I would like to see these sand miners being rehabilitated in, and these areas turning into sanctuaries. For example, in Honey Creek, that's an area where we have a huge flamingo population which comes in every year. So rather than mining sand and destroying the habitat, if these guys could be made part of a flamingo sanctuary in that area, that would be the solution I would be very keen on. And the government has heeded us to a little bit, to some extent. A part of that area has been declared as a flamingo sanctuary. So that's some news I'm very happy to share with you. Mm -hmm. They have also done other things which I'm happy to share with you, and that is that they have said that the garbage dump in Mumbai, which periodically burns, makes Mumbai the most air polluted city in the world, should be recycled and used to construct building aggregate. They have designated separate spots for debris, which is which comes from demolished buildings. You know, I always say Mumbai is not a city under construction. <coughs> it's a city under reconstruction. We're breaking down the existing city, we're making taller, bigger, shinier towers. But what happens to the debris that we have right now? It's being dumped either in the garbage dump or it's being dumped in vacuums and mangroves. So rather than that, they have started the process. They haven't yet done it. But to designate areas where debris can be taken and where it might be recycled. But these are experimental projects. I think until we mandate their use, end use, we will not see enough money, R&D, all those other things put into it to mainstream it and make it commercially viable. So we need the government and we need corporations. Thank you very much. So I, I think we should applaud the This is a fantastic testimony and a, a lot of courage. I mean, uh, what you've achieved, you know, nearly alone, uh, it's uh, unbelievable. And now, um, not even say you're not allowed anymore. I mean, uh, we, your voice is a is taken in consideration and we'll be in touch and continue to work with you and uh, the inclusion for our reports and uh, will be very key and this report will be brought to the attention of the Ministry of the Environment and the whole world. So we really help uh, we really hope that um, we get your, your contribution on that one. We'll keep in touch. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you and thank you to all of you. It was a great pleasure to be here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that's, uh, that was something. So, please, Louise, next. Uh, well, there's no a transition. Big transition time. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a bit of food for thought for you, I think, as we maybe will take a quick.